in the history of the navigation of the Great Lakes. Published in 1911, Ralph Gordon Plum. Quote, then followed the first disaster of magnitude that occurred on Lake Michigan. This was the burning of the Phoenix off Sheboygan on November 21st, 1847. This boat, too, had 250 immigrants from Holland on board en route to Milwaukee. The lake had been rough, and the boat had remained in Manitowoc Harbor until it was thought safe to venture out. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story, The Phoenix in Flames? Here we are. Enjoy! The 305-ton propeller steamship, the Phoenix, was only a couple of years old when she sailed into the storm on Lake Michigan. She was built in 1845 in Cleveland, Ohio, for the firm of Pease and Allen. The Phoenix was a state-of-the-art workhorse for her time, both in the freight and passenger trade. The first propeller steamer on the Great Lakes had only been built in 1841, but it was already being realized that the new design offered many advantages. The Phoenix would have more than enough trade to keep her busy. The growth of towns and cities around the Great Lakes was explosive, especially with the influx of immigrants that were coming in large groups from towns in the Netherlands and Germany. This large immigration movement meant that Milwaukee, a very popular destination, had grown from less than 1,000 people in 1840 to around 13,500 by 1847, when an estimated group of 150 to 175 new immigrants from the Netherlands got on board the Phoenix at Buffalo, New York on the 11th of November, 1847. Their destination was listed as Milwaukee, though it is likely that at least some of them intended to travel even further. In addition to the immigrants from the Netherlands, there were an estimated 50 to 100 additional passengers and 25 to 30 crew members under the command of Captain Sweet. The Phoenix was also carrying a large cargo of coffee, sugar, and molasses bound for Chicago. It did not seem likely, based on the descriptions for the Phoenix, that she could have carried anything else, even if the owners desired her to. The vessel almost immediately met with strong seas, though it was not so bad that she was not able to continue the voyage. It was in a harbor that the first accident of the voyage occurred, though the details are not disclosed. At some point, while they were at Fairport, Ohio, Captain Sweet fell and injured his leg. Some people said it was a fractured knee, while others said he broke his leg. Either way, it caused him to be restricted to his cabin, unable to walk, and the command of the vessel was turned over to the mate. Under the command of the mate, a man named Watts, the ship passed through the Straits of Mackinac while the weather became even rougher. On November 20th, around 4 p.m., the ship was turned to put into Manitowoc, partially to refill their wood supply, but also to shelter in the hopes that the seas would soon go down. It would not be until 1 in the morning on the 21st of November that the Phoenix departed Manitowoc, now experiencing calmer waters. Their next stop was planned to be Sheboygan, but the Phoenix would never reach there. As the ship left Manitowoc, most of the passengers had already gone to bed. Some of the passengers who were awake would later claim that the crew, possibly taking advantage of their captain being confined to his cabin, had been partying and drinking in Manitowoc, and that they were therefore not paying as close of attention to the affairs of the ship as they should have been. Still, the fireman on duty in the engine room did try to do his duty. As they began to head towards Sheboygan, he reported to the second engineer, who was on duty at the time, that the ship's pumps were not working. 
though the fireman saw the urgency of the situation, the second engineer failed to, and failed to act on the information or wake up the chief engineer. A little while later, the fireman again went to the second engineer, this time reporting that because the pumps were not working, the water in the boilers was getting very low, and the boilers were getting very hot. Perhaps this additional information would have led to action, but there would be no time. The red-hot boilers caught the deck near them on fire before anything could be done to cool them down. It was later claimed by one of the passengers that it was not only the fireman who was dismissed when he tried to sound the alarm about the boilers. Some passengers had also tried to bring to the attention of the crew that there was something wrong with the boiler room, only to be told to mind their own business, and one man who insisted he was even knocked down. It would not be until four in the morning that the fire was discovered where it had started under the deck near the back of the boiler. As soon as the black smoke was seen billowing, all disharmony between the crew and the passengers, if it had existed, was put aside. The reservoirs on the ship were opened, pumps were made to work, and anyone who was capable of it was put to work passing water to quench the blaze. This effort was continued until flames, and at one point was even considered to have been a success until fire burst out from under the deck on either side of the men who were fighting the fire and drove them back. It was later believed by the first mate that they had indeed put out the first fire, but that the boilers had started a second fire since they were still too hot. With the appearance of a second and larger fire, despair and panic took hold. There was no longer any hope of saving the ship, and people began to scramble to try to save themselves or find loved ones. The Phoenix had three boats, one swinging from each side and one hanging from her stern, and they managed to lower two of these around 4.45 in the morning. Even this was done with a struggle. Seeing that the panicked passengers were going to rush one of the boats, another passenger, a man named David Blish, took it upon himself to hold back the crowd so that the boat could be launched successfully and get it off safely. Once the boat was launched, Blish oversaw the loading of about 20 people on board it, which was about what it could hold. It seems to have been with general agreement between the passengers and crew alike that Blish then went to the captain's cabin and helped Captain Sweet into the boat. Whether he stayed or not, Captain Sweet would not be able to help anyone with his injured leg, and he would have no chance of escaping on his own. Captain Sweet was therefore told to take charge of the first boat and lower it into it. The people in the boat did call to Blish to come and take a spot as well, but he refused, saying that there were still things to do on the ship. There are several accounts of what happened to Blish in the end, but no one denied that Blish was a hero. A lumber merchant with a very successful business, Blish was a large enough figure in the community to demand special treatment, but instead, the reports of those who survived said that Blish had done everything possible to fight the fire and comfort those who remained after the boats departed. In one story, Blish was seen going down below decks and carrying out anyone he could find who had succumbed to the smoke until he finally did not come up again. Presumably, having fallen victim to the fire himself. In another version of the story, Blish built many rafts for people to escape on. Having finally built himself a raft and taking two small children in his arms, he held them and himself onto the raft until he succumbed to the cold. In spite of the discrepancies in the stories about how Blish fell victim to the disaster, there was no one from the wreck of the Phoenix who said that Blish had been anything other than the most active person when it came to saving lives and fighting the blaze for as long as possible? Soon after, the second boat was also launched. This one under the command of the mate, and containing 19 other people. Several people would be added to the load of the boats, even though they were already at capacity. One woman flung herself into the boat as it departed, 
and two little girls of two or three were flung to the boat from the deck in a desperate attempt to save them, and they were also caught. Another woman did not make it into the boat as she jumped and was compelled to cling to the stern for the entire voyage because the boat was too overloaded to bring her on board. As the boats departed, they assured those on board that once they had deposited people on shore, they would return to try to save the others. Meanwhile, as the fire grew in intensity, preparations began to be made for people to have to leave the ship whether or not the boats returned. The people on board the Phoenix began to throw anything that might be used as a flotation device into the water. Even though they knew that the water was so bitterly cold that it was unlikely that they would fare any better in the water than on the ship. Meanwhile, the fire had driven everyone to the extreme ends of the ship, and people were forced to take refuge either on the hurricane deck or in the rigging. These were only a temporary respite. Soon, the fire spread up the tarred ropes of the rigging, causing the people who were clinging to the rigging to either fall into the flames below or the freezing water of the lake. The glow of the fire was hard to miss in Sheboygan. It lit up the night sky, and since it was out in the lake, it was clear that there was a ship on fire. Two captains who were at anchor there immediately got ready to see what they could do. Captain Porter, on a schooner named Liberty, could not go out in his ship due to a lack of wind, so he and his crew got in one of his ship's lifeboats and began to row towards the fire. Meanwhile, a propeller steamship named the Delaware, under the command of Captain Tuttle, began to get up steam with the intention of also going to help, though it was a painfully slow process for those on board who knew that every second counted. While the Delaware got ready to depart, the population of Sheboygan began to gather on the beach, and a flotilla of small boats began to be launched from the shore by people hoping they might be of aid. In spite of the delay for the Delaware to build up steam, the advantages of steam still meant that the Delaware was the first to arrive at the scene of the disaster at about 7 in the morning. Captain Porter in his lifeboat arrived shortly after, followed by one of the boats of the Phoenix, which had kept its word to come back to try to save others. The water was full of wreckage, in many cases with people floating on top of debris. The ship itself was past all help. It had burned to the waterline by the time that the Delaware could reach it. Chief Engineer House was the first person to realize that help had arrived, and he began to shout for assistance, as well as to shout to those around him that help had arrived. Unfortunately, most of the people around him turned out to be beyond all help. It was found that many of the people who had found themselves clinging to pieces of wreckage had succumbed to the cold due to the freezing water of Lake Michigan in late November. Chief Engineer House had stuck with the Phoenix until the last moment possible. As the flames finally drove him overboard, he used an axe to cut a fender free and dove overboard with it. He soon found the door from one of the staterooms, which had been thrown into the water, and, having tied the fender to the door with the handkerchief he wore around his neck, the chief engineer held on for two and a half hours until the Delaware arrived. Following his shouts, Chief Engineer House was the first person to be pulled from the water by the Delaware. Also saved would be a passenger named Mr. Long from Milwaukee, who had been traveling with his wife and child. His wife and child had drowned, and Mr. Long had not been able to save them, but he had managed to cling to the rudder of the ship in the company of the ship's clerk. A boat lowered from the Delaware, found the two men, and pulled them off. On board the Delaware, the men were given dry clothing and revived. Aware that the three men were in rough condition, and seeing no other people who could be saved, the Delaware turned back to Sheboygan, leaving its two boats, as well as the boats that followed, to begin the solemn duty of collecting remains. Behind it 
the Delaware towed the still smoldering remains of the Phoenix. When the 42 people who had escaped the blaze in the ship's boats reached the shore, the first thing Captain Sweet did was light a fire. Many of the people in the boats were lightly dressed since they had been woken up in early morning hours, and the weather was dangerously cold. The point where they landed was about 10 miles from Sheboygan, and there was little chance of immediate assistance. When it was learned in Sheboygan where the boats had landed, wagons full of supplies were dispatched, and the people were brought back to Sheboygan where they were met with incredible kindness. Captain Sweet, despite being in a good deal of pain, and being described as very ill at this point, took charge of one of the boats from the Phoenix to head back to the burning wreck. With him went the mate, as well as a few members of the crew who had accompanied them on the boats. It was decided to leave behind all the passengers on the beach to warm themselves by the fire. Even if they had wanted to also return in the other boat, the boat that had been under the command of the mate was practically useless. In the confusion, it had been launched with only one oar, and they had only reached the shore by also employing a broom to row. The boat had also leaked terribly, and the passengers had been forced to bail with their shoes. It was generally agreed that the only reason the boat had reached the shore at all was thanks to the calm after the storm which had made them shelter in Manitowoc. The Phoenix was towed to the North Pier in Sheboygan, where she sank in eight feet of water, no longer able to stay afloat. The sailors on the Delaware would later express their horror at how fast the Phoenix, a relatively new ship in good condition, had become a ruin that had cost so many lives. The Delaware's return to Sheboygan was a solemn affair, as the people who had been waiting on shore came to realize the horror of what had happened. It did not take long for the news to spread. Many of the people who had been traveling on the Phoenix had friends and family who had emigrated before and who were waiting for them, and the disaster rocked the immigrant community. It was hard to even know who all had been on the ship. The officers and passengers did their best to create a list from their memory, but it was a very sparse one when compared to the number of people who were said to be on the ship. By noon, the people who had landed in the two boats from the Phoenix had been brought into Sheboygan, where they were met with every hospitality possible for the few weeks it took for them to recover and collect themselves. Many of them had lost everything, including their families. One girl of 17, for example, found herself alone in the world, even though she had been traveling with a party of 25. Another girl, found herself the sole guardian of her baby sister, who was one of the toddlers thrown down into the boat as it had left. Not only had they lost their whole families, but most of the people who were traveling on the Phoenix as immigrants had brought all of the money they had in the world, and that had sank with the Phoenix. They were now in a strange land, without knowing anyone, and with no means to support themselves. It was therefore fortunate that the people of Sheboygan opened their doors to them for as long as was needed. The crew of the Phoenix was also quickly taken care of. The same day that the Phoenix was towed into Sheboygan, Captain Tuttle of the Delaware brought the crew of the Phoenix home. With the exception of Captain Sweet, who was too weak and ill to travel. The papers were kind to Captain Sweet. Even though a captain being among the first to leave his ship, it was agreed was generally not acceptable. That he had been too injured to be of much use, and had been placed in the boat for humanitarian reasons, was considered an exception to this rule. The papers were equally fair to Chief Engineer House. The fire had been started by the boilers, but House had been asleep at the time that the fire started and had remained with the ship to assist until it was impossible. The passengers could complain of a drunken crew who had disregarded the warnings that something was wrong, but they could not deny that those who had escaped were free from blame 
even if this was the case. The fact that many of the immigrants had been traveling with their worldly fortunes was enough to inspire a desire to attempt salvage. In March of 1848, Captain Tuttle of the Delaware was granted salvage rights to the Phoenix by merit of being the one who had taken her under tow. Nothing would come of it, however, and the remains of the Phoenix remain off the shores of Sheboygan. A testament to a terrible disaster that would shake communities on both sides of the Atlantic. A note from the archive. The Delaware, under the command of a different captain, would play a similar role in an equally devastating disaster on Lake Erie in 1850, this time when the immigrant ship E.P. Griffith caught fire off of Cleveland. Again, the Delaware showed up too late to save much life. The E.P. Griffith, while an inferno, had struck a sandbank and many people had drowned before the Delaware arrived on the scene. It was estimated that the toll was even worse than that of the Phoenix. The Delaware took the survivors on board and took the smoldering E.P. Griffith in tow to shore, just as it had almost three years before with the Phoenix. For more information, please see the Independent American and General Advertiser from December 3, 1847, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.